What's up everyone? Today I am here in this Christmas season with Dr. Chip Dodd and we're going to talk about the burden of hope in the midst of this Advent series on This Is Where Life Exists. Welcome to a podcast about disciple making in the public square where we talk about everyday issues from a biblical and balanced perspective. This is where life exists. This is Where Life Exists, where we talk about everyday issues from a biblical and balanced perspective. My name is Dahadi Lewis, lead pastor of Blueprint Church and the vice president of the Sin Network. And I am here with Dr. Chip Dodd. Feliz Navidad. But you know, Chip, I'm in the midst of trying to learn Spanish, so I'm still butchering it now. But yes, I love it. Six, six months from now, I will be able to speak conversationally. I love it. And I didn't mention to you beforehand, but... I think we're on the verge of doing a voice of the heart translation into Spanish. That's it. Hey, I may be able to do it for you. You know what I'm saying? Like, hey, yeah. that's oh. no. <laughs> no. <laughs> that's no, that's you, not Honey, I know you do lots of things, but that's not it. <laughs> that's not it. That's not it. Okay. Well, what does it mean well Yes. So let's go ahead and jump in. Today, we're, the, we're in the midst of an Advent series. I just got literally just got down with preaching a sermon on Acts chapter nine, talking about just the, the idea of Advent. And, you know, and this is an ad, in Acts, I'm sorry, Acts in Isaiah nine, um, verse six, it talks about, you know, where it talks about he is wonderful counselor, prince of peace, everlasting father. And yeah. in there, he talks about prince of peace. And But in there, we talk about Advent as a whole. He, we, we see this idea that there's kind of an already but not yet, that Isaiah is calling them to look to the hills in which their help is coming, but their help is not there yet, right? And then we also recognize that the fulfillment of the Isaiah actually did not come in its totality, in its completeness, until 2,000 years later. 2,000 years later. And so, you know, they were in this kind of hope. They even died with this idea of hoping or even the burden of hoping. So my question um, to you is this like, one is like, what is hope? Is, is hope just simply sheer optimism? What is hope? How do you define hope? How do you even relate to this idea of kind of the burden of hope? I, I love it. it, it uh, hope is something over which what hope is something that was born into us that we didn't create, number mm -hmm. one. Number two is that you can't get away from it, but you, you can run as far as possible, but it goes where you go. Mm -hmm. And hope is believing that there's a life that you're actually made to live here, you hope for something, you're hoping for something, you're hoping, you're wishing, desiring, longing, hoping. It's it, Hope is the energy of believing that something better is coming. Well, man, and I think that that reality has been a lot of people's 2020 and even life, yes. but let's focus in on 2020, yes. is that the belief that some, there's something better for this life, yes. you know, and living in that hope. And then when you are living in the tension of wanting something better for this life, but not living in that reality, that is burdensome. Yes, and, and, and see, the moment we have hope in a world that is full of struggle and tragedy, because hope is in conflict with tragedy, because we're hoping that the tragedy will end. We're hoping that the struggle will stop. But the moment you hope for something, you're literally craving something you don't have which means that you have to know what to do with fear. Yeah. Because as soon as you're wishing for something you don't have, it's out there and you're not sure you're going to get it. So you're automatically are thrust into dealing with your life emotionally because hope is scary. Yeah. So you got to do fear. And then hope is also something that brings us to pain because a lot of times the hopes we have don't come true. But here's the beauty. Christians are able to hope in ways that non-Christians cannot hope. Yeah. Because in Christ, hope is actually fulfilled. And so we're already guaranteed eternity. Hmm. And I'm not talking about you live for eternity. Eternity is already ours. You don't live for it, it's already a given. But now we have to carry the burden of wanting to do everything we can possibly here to make it like where we're going. Yeah. 
we're called to hope that heaven can be here as well as there, that on earth as it is in heaven. Hmm. So we're, but we're burdened with the responsibility that in spite of the world's tragedy, 2020 is a year of absolute tragedy. And yet in spite of the tragedy in Christ, we keep hoping, we keep taking that hope and walking through fear and continuing to persevere in the things we're called to do while we're here. And, and, and that means planting orchards, so to speak. That means doing good, like Philippians 4, 8, whatever is good and right and just and lovely and praiseworthy and excellent, like be about those things, be for those things. Right. But then you could say, well, they, you know, it's not fair, it's not right, all these things are happening. And it's like, yes, that's true. But in Christ, we're not called to stop. We're called to keep hoping, one, because we already have a home in eternity, and two is we're called to ameliorate pain and call people to the hope we have inside of us right. unless we don't really have it. Yeah. But if tragedy overcomes us, then we were not really hoping in Christ. We were hoping in culture, Dahadi. So let's talk about that. You talk about the idea of hoping in Christ versus hoping in culture. How do you differentiate uh -huh. the two? Um, because it seems like right now in a season that we are in with, you know, the still the distrife between that's going on in America, the distrife that's going on within even our denomination, my denomination that I'm in with Southern Baptists, with the, the strife that's taking place between black and white, you know, that there seems that there's so much division, you know, and so as, as I look into the land, I see many people going into further darkness versus coming into the light. So how, how do you differentiate the two um, those two. Yeah. Yeah. And it's beautiful. Cause like wh wh what does, how does, what does Christ call us to do? Everybody's got to look into their own conscience, look into their own hearts and look into the book that tells us and calls us uh, how to, how to, to live a redeemed life. We got to look into the scriptures. What is, what are we called to live like? What are we called to do? Every man and woman has to answer that for himself or herself, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. And, and it, if, if we're not doing that, then instead of hoping in Christ and living accordingly to the passion we have within us that he calls us to, saved by grace through faith, not by work, so that no, nobody gets to boast, but we're called according to his purposes. He's given us something to do. Right. And whatever that is, we need to be about doing it. But if we're ending up trusting, okay, like, like technology, economics, uh, uh, the health, health uh, uh, medicine, all of those are tools. But if we depend upon those things as if those things are the it that's going to fix everything, then we, we are being idolatrous. We have to ask ourselves, how am I called to live in Christ? And then, then it's like that's, that's beyond any cultural, political, economic, technological issue, and um, so let's, I'm just, let's I'm, put that let's put that to to work. That that you yeah. know that understanding to work. Okay, right now we talked about let's. Oftentimes we talk about some of the the racial divide. You know, as you know, I'm doing a series a series called Why I Stay, and in that series, there's been a lot of people who are saying, "No, we need to leave," right, and you know, and just kind of this, the tension that is going on. So uh, how would you apply what you just said to yeah. this, that, yeah. this scenario? I, I think, I think that we, we're going to have to get rid of, uh, what is it called? Like a litmus test, like litmus test, like, uh, okay, I got, I got seven questions to ask you to test to see if you have the right to be my friend. Yeah. They're like okay. diagnostic questions. We're going to have to get rid of those because what I'm watching happening is that I have been close to and uh, companions with, even friends with, uh, acquaintances with, teaching with, counseling with people from all walks of life. And I mean all walks of life. I mean worldwide. I don't mean just in my town. And I'm noting that the deceiver is a divider and a, 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 a thief and a liar. And I'm seeing some very, some of the very people 
that I have had relationship with for years, suddenly casting eyes of suspicion on me, hmm. uh, uh, not close to me, separate from me. And I, and I read in the faces something that wasn't there before. But I'm reading in the faces, which means not talking to the hearts or not talking back and forth. Mm. And when we start reading in the faces of people, we're going to read our fears instead of our hopes. And, and when we start reading in the faces of people, we're going to read the negativity. We're going to read the judgmentalism instead of reading the hopes of uh, companionship and connection and even the, the chemistry of, of connection. And I'm seeing that, that, that us trusting in culture more than Christ. And I'm not talking about not making change. I mean, our whole society has been changing, you know, ever since we started America. I mean, we've been changing, dealing, growing, shifting, but I, I'm seeing us depend more on culture than on Christ. But if you say, it's yes, weird. it has been changing, but it has also, and to some degree, yet been remaining the same, you yeah. know? And I think that is, to some degree, some of the angst and the frustration that we have. And even some, for me, it's like, like I am saying, this is, like, I'm doing a series on why I stay, but it seems like time after time, it becomes more and more hard and more and more difficult to say that with conviction because of how hard it is. So, you know, there's, so there, there's, that I'm holding out in, with hope for things to continue to change and to continue to push forward. But there's a tremendous pain that I, you know, that I have in the midst of it. Yeah. And, you know, I'm, I'm finding in some ways myself as um, suddenly not accepted uh, as maybe I thought I once was, or that I'm judged more than I once uh, hoped uh, it's for it to be different, mm -hmm. that I'm not listened to because of appearance. Yeah. Um, that, and, and, and there are a lot of people who are hurting and resentful and, um, in pain that would say, I deserve it. So how do we press into that? How do we help give people to trust Christ more than trust culture, because I do, and I agree with you, it has put, yeah. it, the, trusting in culture has given us suspicious eyes uh, towards one another, yeah. you know, yeah. and so how do we go back to this burden of hope that this Advent That's series and yeah. helps us to, to overcome? Yeah, I, one is I think we come together around confession, confessing our need for Jesus Christ, hmm. that we come together and from the standpoint of saying, I don't give a crap where you came from. And uh, frankly put, I don't care what you've done. What I care about is that you know the one who also came to find me. Hmm. I mean, I think that's a beginning piece. And I know that can be a trap for, oh yeah, yeah, oh I see, yeah, we come around Christ, then everything's fine. No, we come around the unity in Christ that allows us to deal with all the problems of the world knowing full well that they don't all get fixed, but we continue to hope that they can be fixed for the one. Hmm. Um, I think we make a big mistake. And this is going to sound terrible, but we make a big mistake when we try to change. I know this is going to sound crazy. When we just try to change society instead of, uh, instead of us changing each other, because mm -hmm. change occurs through us being with each other. Do the two I mean, need to be pitted against the, each other? Do we need to be? I mean, do we need to pit those two together? Because we've talked about like the difference between reformation and being reformed, right? If we're saying yeah. reforming society versus reformation of the heart. Yeah. Yes. And, and and see, I think that's where we that this is the part where, you know, in Christ. And when we start to talk in Christ, we move towards talking about in church. But the church doesn't know the language of the heart either. The church is trapped. I hate to say this, but the church is trapped in the things that that you and I know that the church doesn't accept. I mean, the, the story of the heart, the makeup of the heart, what the heart is. I mean, the church rejects heart. And so it's hard for the church to lead reform. If the church doesn't accept that humans are made a certain way, that we reject the Psalms, we reject the heart, we reject feelings, we reject grief, 
we reject anger, we reject hurt, we reject sadness. And somehow because you're a Christian, you don't have those things. I think it's because we're Christians, we can deal with those things so that you and I can look at each other, both of us in Christ. And we come from very different worlds. And yet, do we? And the answer is yes, but do we? The answer is no. Right. We come from very different worlds experientially and through judgment and prejudice and heartache and heartbreak. But we come from the same place when you look at just the heart itself and the experience of it. We come from the same place because so both of them. Because because a lot of times when we when you talk about the difference between reforming the heart versus reformation, right? Um, reformation of society. And you said that we don't need to do it. So let me give you the example oftentimes, right? Because, you know, oftentimes we hear we need to listen. We need to hear one another and things. Like if you were to go into the garage and you heard Sonya screaming, right? Your wife, she was screaming in the garage. And you walk into the garage and you see um, a tire. The car has fell down on your wife's leg. And she's screaming out to you, right? Um, are you immediately going to go, like, what are you going to do? You're going to naturally do everything that you can. You're going to listen to your wife, but you're going to listen with what needs to happen so that you can now lift that car off of her leg and do what you do to address the, address the problem, right? And so I guess my, my question to you is, where uh, there's a people that feel that we feel like that there's a society that has a car on us. There's an oppressive system that is on us. And so the question is, is that when it's hard to hear sometimes when you say, hey, we just simply got to reform the heart as this car is laying on us. I guess, how would you, where, where yeah, do you feel like that analogy I, breaks down and how would you I'm answer that? I'm saying that reformers need to be searching for those crying out. Okay. I mean, so reformers, Christ, Christ's people are, are, have their ears open to those who sound like them. Okay. Christ believers listen to those who are screaming the same scream they themselves once screamed. Okay. We're all the good Samaritan if we're in Christ. And so we're able to see, hear, and listen to what we're called to move towards. Like some people, the cry out under the car, you, you say systemic racism, oppression, the cry out of the unborn, the cry out of, of in terms of people being cheated and stolen from, people being like the poor people taking their goods from them and using them of uh, uh, political uh, abusive systems. I mean, we're all called in Christ to do reform. Yeah. And uh, it's, we're not all called to the same things, but we're all called. Mm -hmm. But if we're not listening to the pain, then we've forgotten our salvation. Yeah. And if we're not doing something about the pain, then we're not participating in our own redemption. Yeah. We're not so living lives. So what I hear is that you have to, you start going to those who are crying out and from there, you then leverage what you, you, what you have to be able to meet someone Yes. Need. Yeah. And, you know, that's right in front of us, too, Dahadi. Like, that's like that's like, you know, years ago, uh, Sonia had gone somewhere with her little brother and before we were married. She came home and the garage door was down. And when she left, it was up. And they lived out in the country. And she called me and I grabbed a gun and I went out there because somebody had broken in their house or something. Her parents were gone. And I walked in with a gun and there was a man in the garage and he was like pacing like, Oh, and I thought, oh, okay, something's really wrong here. And I walked in, he said, what, what are you doing? What are you doing? I'm like, uh, I'm just coming in. And I had the gun. He said, you've been squirrel hunting. And I said, no. And then he started telling me like, Hey, I pushed the doorbell and the garage door went down. I didn't know how to get out. I said, where are you from? And he, he had uh, been a patient at the, VA hospital and had walked five miles along the river and disappeared. And then he said, I used to go squirrel hunt with my daddy. And he was a veteran of war, post-traumatic stress, uh, obviously some kind of terrible head injury. And uh, I asked Sonia, Sonia, would you, this man's freezing. Will you grab a blanket from the house and make coffee? And I stood out there with him in the garage. I said, call the sheriff too. And we need to get him back to the hospital. And, um, uh, 
uh, and he got that coffee to Hadi and he, he drank it like it was water. And I thought, oh my God, he just scorched his throat. And it was just horrible. And I was like, oh, life is so rough. But we, we got him back where he was from and tragically, but we got him a blanket, we got him coffee, we gave him compassion, we gave him tenderness. I was guarded to make sure that Sonia was okay and her brother was okay, that no harm was coming. But in Christ, like I recognized that man uh, from uh, because of my uncle, a veteran, was became schizophrenic, saw people burn up in tanks, became an alcoholic, was already came from the country, just rough, rough background. Uh, I, I knew that, that I gave to this man what I would have needed for me. I gave to this man uh, the help that I had. And I think that in so many ways that, that that compassion that we have within us is about doing what's in front of us, what we can, instead of talking, getting our hands dirty with helping the person in front of us with a blanket, the coffee, a phone call, you know, I yeah. mean, you don't have a gun, I guess, but yeah. you know, and yeah, I just think that, that we really need to be caring for the, the person that's presented to us. Yeah, that's you know? good. And I think that's very biblical. And you mentioned it earlier. I mean, this is the good Samaritan. And so, yeah. I man, Chip, I really appreciate it. And we hey, can go can I say on. One last on. thing. I'm, yeah. Can I say one, one of the things that I've noticed that when I've gone around, I've talked about the voice of the heart. And I've talked about uh, uh, how we're created and that feelings aren't insanity. They're an expression of our cry out to experience each other as helpmates and God as our rescue. And do you know who listens to me most? Anyone who knows what pain is hmm. or anyone who has experienced oppression, anyone who has experienced the, 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 the rejection of how God made them anyone who has been cheated or stolen from or has done something they think there's no forgiveness for. Mm. So, you know, I have found that in um, all of my work, it's uh, people of color, people of poverty, people of woundedness, white, black, brown, just go down the list. But anyone who identifies with uh, uh having been in need or know what pain is, they're attracted to what I'm sharing and giving. And what I've seen is that color, economic background, and even what country we're from, even what religion we are disappears in the face of that. Hmm. I've seen that. Yeah. Yeah. That's really so the, good. Yeah. That's really good. And, and it's, I mean, pain, shows no discrimination it's it's None. it's it has it's not a respecter of person yeah and really and what i hear you saying is that we got to be able to look from within at our own pain so that we can stand beside one another in other people's pain and be able to meet the needs of the pain and that's really what we said is the go to root treat others in the way you wouldn't want to be treated you know and so i really do appreciate it I, I appreciate your perspective as always you know when it comes to this especially in this season where we're bearing the burden of hope you know in this season as we're reminded in hope and again this is another episode of where life exists where we talk about everyday issues from a biblical and balanced perspective my name is dahati lewis and we were with dr chip dodd i recommend you going out and grabbing that book the voice of the heart because it will help you to be able to speak to the pain in which you are and the feelings that God has given us um, to both to tell the truth about what's going on inside of us. Until next time, Merry Christmas.